So I'm Tom O'Donnell. I'm the executive director of the LBJ Washington Center, which is the Washington campus of the LBJ School of Public Affairs in Austin. And I want to welcome you to the Hardeman Prize. And tonight we're honoring the 29th recipient of that prize, historian, professor, a historian from Princeton, Professor Julian Zelazar. And of course, we're honored to be joined as our moderator by Tom Daschle, Majority Leader of the United States Senate for many of the good years, as I recall. A couple logistics things. Right after this, we're going to have a reception. Our alumni and our current fellows will show you it's right there through this open doorway. We have lots of food. We have lots of drinks. So please come see our center, the actual where it all happens. And at 8.09, we will have the World Series on if we, <laughs> if we run that late. I'm not that big a fool. Uh, a few thanks, the LBJ Foundation, who is a great sponsor in the private sector of the LBJ School, of the LBJ Library, and now the LBJ Washington Center. Of course, uh, LBJ and Lady Bird's daughters, Lucy and Linda, they know Linda. Linda was going to be here tonight, but she is a new grandmother. So, as usual, she has her priorities right, and she's just thrilled. Uh, Ben Barnes, the uh, former lieutenant governor of Texas, who without him, there would be no LBJ Washington Center. And of course, my deputy, Robin Boone, from whom all good things come. Nothing could happen without Robin. And the Partnership for Public Service for giving us a really good break on this room. We appreciate it. Uh, a couple of recognitions. We have with us most of our 2018 LBJ DC fellows right here, these nine, I think. So this is a unique program at the LBJ school. They're in what's called the DC concentration in federal policy. They study two semesters in Austin. They then move immediately to Washington. They study at night and work full time all through the city in policy apprenticeships. It's a pretty brutal and rigorous uh, 18 months, but they graduate six months early with a full degree and they're in the Washington market. And they graduate in December and they need jobs. Okay, so that's really the purpose of this event. I didn't want to tell you that, Professor. Uh, I also see that we have LBJ's last chief of staff. Back then, they called it the appointments, uh, appointments secretary. And Jim Jones, who then went on to have a rather mediocre career, which included uh, House budget chairman and ambassador to Mexico. He's also a member of the LBJ Board of Trustees, the Foundation's Board of Trustees. We have Lyndon Boozer from AT&T, who's on the LBJ School Advisory Council. And I know we have several congressmen here. We have former majority whip Dave Bonnier is here. We have Mike Andrews. We have is. Uh, is Jim Moran here, Martin Lancaster, Chet Edwards. Chet Edwards, and I said Mike Andrews. Okay, before I turn it over to Leader Daschle, I just want to put a little perspective on the magnitude of LBJ's presidency. He was only president for five years, and in 2017, C-SPAN did a survey of presidential historians. And they ranked them all from Washington to Obama, they ranked them overall, and then they ranked them by discrete categories. So overall, LBJ finished 10th, which considering the tragedy of Vietnam is a remarkably high rating, I would say. But it's in these subcategories that you see just how monumental his five years were. So one of the categories they were ranked on is administrative skills. How well did they run their administrations? LBJ was ranked sixth all time among all presidents. One of the other categories was relations with the U.S. Congress. He was number one in the history of the country, number one. Do you know who number two was? George Washington. <laughs> number three, FDR. Number four, Lincoln. So it's pretty good company. But the category that I think is most impressive, and I think there can be bipartisan admiration for that kind of competency, but the one that I like the best is pursued equal justice for all. So they ranked all the presidents on how they pursued equal justice for all. Now, not surprisingly, Abraham Lincoln was number one. Number two was LBJ. So give you a sense of how easy it is for Robin and I to do our job, we feel like we're wearing white hats most of the time. Which brings me to another master of the Senate, Tom Daschle, 
served four terms in the House of Representatives. Now, I think he was always an admirer of LBJ because in Leader Daschle's first race in the House, he won by a staggering 139 votes. Is that true? Have I got that number correct? And, of course, that echoes LBJ's famous Linden, uh, landslide Linden win when he won by 87 votes in a Senate primary in 1948. Uh, leader Daschle served 18 years in the Senate, both as majority leader and as minority leader. And I don't know if you knew this, but only Lyndon Johnson had served fewer years in the Senate before his colleagues made him the leader. So a lot of LBJ ties there. Uh, Leader Daschle is also one of four former majority leaders to form the Bipartisan Policy Center. He's on the Board of Trustees of the LBJ Foundation, and he's on the Hardeman Prize National Selection Committee. So without further ado, I give you the Honorable Thomas A. Daschle of Aberdeen, South Dakota. Thank you very much, Tom, for that kind introduction, my goodness. What he didn't tell you is that 139 votes in South Dakota is 60 percent. <laughs> so, I, uh, I am flattered that uh, I have the opportunity to be the moderator tonight. I look out over this, this uh, impressive group of people, and I'm all the more appreciative of the commitment so many of you made to our country in so many, many ways. One person that didn't get mentioned that ought to be mentioned is Richard Baker, the former historian for the United States Senate, who I relied on daily, if not weekly. And I must say, I'm grateful for his service to his country as well. Dick could probably probably re regale us with stories for, for the next several hours. But one of my favorite traditions in the Senate uh, one that uh, we don't do in the House, is that you have the opportunity to carve your name in the desk at which you sit on the Senate floor. I had the good fortune, and it's one of the highest honors that uh, I have ever had in my lifetime, to sit at the same desk as LBJ for 10 years and to carve my name next to his at the end of my time in the Senate in 2005. What a remarkable thing to sit and to think of the history, to think of the extraordinary contribution that Lyndon Johnson made, not only while he was president, but for those six years when he was leader. One of my favorite quotes of LBJ's occurred not when he was in the Senate, but when he was president. It was on March 15th of 1965 at a joint session of Congress speaking on voting rights. He said, somehow you never forget what poverty can do when you see its scars on the hopeful faces of a young child. He said, I never, never thought I'd be here in 1928, but here I am in 1965 standing before you. He said, never in my wildest and most fondest aspirations did I ever think that I would have the chance to help the sons and daughters of those students? But now I do. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I intend to use it. I love that quote for two reasons. One, because it captures his motivation, but secondly, his determination. And we are... We are the beneficiaries of that legacy some 50 years later. What is somewhat troubling to me is that those in power today have a similar opportunity to create a legacy. But we're mired in dysfunction, polarization. Tonight, I'm hopeful that we could shed a little light on the contrast between then and now, and that we can maybe better understand our circumstances looking through the lens of history. And there is no one better to help us do that than our honoree, the winner of the Hardeman Prize this year. D.B. Hardeman, 
was a longtime aide, as most of you know, to Sam Raver. He was invited by President Johnson to join what was called the Five O'Clock Club, in which they had the opportunity daily to meet at the White House to talk about a presidential, the presidential campaign. The Hardeman Prize is awarded for the best book on the United States Congress from the fields of history and biography, journalism, political science. Dr. Zeller, Zelzer is the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton. He's one of the pioneers in the revival of American political history and the only two-time winner of the Hardeman Prize. His first was for Taxing America, Wilbur Mills, Congress, the State, 1945 to 1975. He is the author and or editor of at least 19 books on American political history and almost 1,000 op-eds. He writes a weekly column for CNN.com. He is the recipient of fellowships from Brookings, Guggenheim, the Russell Sage Foundation, and the New York Historical Society. He has not one but three new books coming out in the near future. Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker and the Rise of a New Republican Party, Abraham Joshua Herschel, which, was a, which is a biography of a leading Jewish theologian uh, of the 20th century. Tonight our hope is not only to present the prize, but to receive what I think will be a memorable tutorial from one of our best historians. Welcome with me, Julian Zelizar. Zelizar. Thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, say a few words. Uh, thanks to everyone for putting this together, uh, to Tom for putting uh, such a, a wonderful uh, a event together for Senator Daschle, for me to, to do this with you. That's an honor for me uh, after studying Congress for so long uh, and, and being in graduate school as I watched you on the Hill. Uh, this is, it's really a pleasure and to all the different members in the room, the different friends in the room, and also to the students, uh, all of you are committed to exactly what we need at this moment, which is public service and a commitment even in polarized times uh, to continue in the important work of government and governance, which I think is more important than ever before. Uh, and I also want to thank Mark Updegrove uh, back in Austin and Samantha Stone, who put everything together uh, for the award and for this event. Uh, it's wonderful to write a book and receive an award. That always feels good. Uh, this was really a labor of love for me. The writing about LBJ and particularly President Johnson's relationship with Congress brought together a lot of different issues and themes I had worked on in some of the other books of my career. I've always been fascinated with Johnson because you know, he is just a phenomenal thread between the two institutions of Congress and the presidency in ways that few other actors, even in FDR, can give us because he inhabited both places. For me, he's always a legislator first, uh, and, and that defined a lot of how he approached the presidency, and I think part of why he ranks so highly on that list. The 1960s is what triggered me to become uh, a, a professor of the modern period. Senator Daschle was asking me about this before. Uh, just in graduate school in the 1980s, there was a revival of the 60s or a fascination with it. So all the contentiousness, the division, uh, the fragmentation, uh, and, and the turmoil really fascinated me. And what fascinated me most uh, although I started by studying the grassroots, was really the people in Washington who were trying to navigate through all of this, dealing with some of the big issues. Uh, the book, I hope some of you have a chance to read it. Uh, there were, uh, I'd say, a, a few uh, kind of big themes that really interested me. One was just understanding 
this moment, which really a lot of it happens in the middle part of the 60s, from 64 to 66, a burst of social legislation, which today is almost inconceivable in scale or scope. Uh, and I, when I would give talks when the book came out and just kind of list some of what happened, it's, it's astounding. Medicare, Medicaid, federal aid for both levels of education, voting rights, civil rights, and, and, and much more. Uh, and to write about it uh, was always of interest to me. How does that happen? How do we have a moment like that when today that seems uh, really uh, the distant past, a different kind of world of politics? And obviously writing about it now, uh, or in this period having the book out, takes on uh, an even uh, different kind of significance when a lot of these programs are clearly at risk. Uh, and what always fascinated me about the Great Society is not just how much legislation passed, but how much of it lasted. Uh, and even though we've gone through the age of Reagan, the conservative revolution in politics, a lot of what Johnson built with the Democratic Congress still stands. Uh, and for me, I have in the book the story where the protesters against President Obama's uh, ACA proposal had the placards, uh, you know, get your government hands off my Medicare, uh, which was funny, and we, we laughed, but in some ways it also si it signaled how deeply inscribed those programs are uh, in society today, uh, for red and blue, uh, to the point that that could be a protest. The second issue, obviously, whenever you study President Johnson, is the war in Vietnam, and, and how that fit. Uh, for me, into the politics of his presidency and to try to understand uh, some of the political dynamics that locked him in that path with the war and ultimately undercut the coalition he was actually trying to nurture back in 64 and 65. And the, the final uh, piece, which is the biggest part of the book, is to understand presidential power in relation to Congress. This is the issue that always fascinates me since I wrote about Wilbur Mills at the beginning. And, and, and President Johnson, after a long time when he didn't have the best reputation, in part because of the legacy of Vietnam, has had a renaissance in the last decade or so where he has emerged as a model, especially in this day and age, of how a president can get things done. We turn to the history uh, of Lyndon Johnson. We turn to Robert Caro's books to understand how do you use power. Uh, and all the historians who deal with uh, President Johnson, this is what interests them. Uh, and, and there was a story uh, about the, uh, Johnson books being circulated to the Senate when ACA was locked up uh, to say, how do you do this? How do you, how do you move a bill? And, and that's an important part of President Johnson, his feel for politics, his understanding of the legislative process was unequaled, in part because, in my mind, he had such respect for congressional power. That's a big theme of the book, that it wasn't that he was an imperial president. It wasn't that he was a president who could do whatever he wanted. It was just the opposite. In many ways, he had such an abiding respect for the power of Congress. He understood it, he feared it, uh, and he orchestrated his presidency around that institution. That's part of why he was effective. So the book covers the early part of his presidency when I try to show how the civil rights movement combined with the election of 1964 opens up this tremendous window. And I bring back the role of the 89th Congress in the great society. It's more a relationship between President Johnson and that Congress that you need in order to understand why so much legislation happened. How do you get the legislative conditions that are necessary for policy making to happen? And then the second half of the book looks at the period between 1966 and 69, uh, from the midterms to the end of his presidency, to show how when those conditions were not quite so favorable, President Johnson encountered a lot of problems uh, in dealing not only with Vietnam, but continuing to produce the same level of legislation. There was one phone call I cite in the book uh, in 1967, a battle has started over a tax surcharge. Uh, President Johnson wants a, uh, to increase taxes to help finance the war. 
and the Great Society, and one member calls him and is frustrated that President Johnson can't do as much as he had done the year before, and he asks him why he can't get things moving on a certain piece of legislation. And he says to the president, why can't you make this happen? After all, you're the master of the Senate. And Johnson, in the phone call, yells at him uh, in, in you know, classic Johnson fashion, saying, master of the Senate. I'm not the master of a damn thing. I'm not the master of nothing. We can't get this Congress to do one damn thing that I know of. And he expresses his understanding and uh, sensibility about the limits that a president faces when those conditions are no longer right. So my book really tries to capture that relationship and use it to understand what happened in the 1960s. Putting LBJ in context in many ways was, was the project of the book, and it really felt like the book of a lifetime. So thank you uh, both for the award and Senator Daschle for being here for the conversation that we're gonna have and for uh, all of you in the room who are here, and lastly, again, where I started, to all of you who have contributed uh, in different ways to public service and to governance, uh, it's really an honor to be with you in this room and to spend my career writing about you. Oh. Now, he, he's already received the cash award, I've been told, so we have a couple of other things for him. Consequential part of the presentation has already occurred. But, uh, <laughs> there is a signing pen and one of the famous LBJ bobbleheads. <laughs> left for me to present, not the check, just the bobblehead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the bobblehead. Okay. So now we're going to have Q&A. Uh, Leader Daschle will kick it off and ask as many questions as he likes, but then we're going to ask the audience to ask questions to either Leader Daschle or to Professor Zelizer. So please be thinking of some questions. Uh, I'll be happy to start. I'm, I'm intrigued, first of all, Jillian, by the title, The Fierce Urgency of Now. Explain the connection between the title and the subject matter. So the, the quote comes from Martin Luther King's speech here in Washington. And in, in some ways, that's when the book takes off. Uh, I, I present Kennedy as a president who really struggled uh, to get around the conservative coalition in Congress, which really, they were the main actors of the period, the Southern Democrats and the Republicans who teamed up. And they had blocked a lot of his agenda, Medicare, civil rights. And King makes that speech here in Washington. And his message is incrementalism, compromise, waiting, uh, was no longer tolerable uh, for the civil rights movement who are risking their lives uh, on a daily basis to get legislation do, uh, done. And so it's a galvanizing moment. And that captures, I think, when the president enters. Uh, but Johnson, in some ways, also understood that message. As much as he was a compromiser, as much as he was a negotiator, he understood the limits of how much time he was going to have to get things done. And he moves very aggressively and he moves fast uh, because he knows that window in Congress will close very soon. So it was both a way to bring back the importance of grassroots pressure in understanding why things happen in Washington, which is a big part of the book, and it's a way to understand Johnson as someone with a sensibility of congressional power, not just presidential power. So early in the book, you address what you consider are two important myths about the 60s. The first is that it was the apex of liberalism, and the second was was somewhat of a surprise to me, but the degree to which we credit LBJ for his savvy and his political uh, his political intelligence and capability. Could you elaborate a little bit more on those myths and uh, how they're relevant to how, how we look at that period? Sure. The, the first one is most textbooks that you'll read uh, or popular accounts of the period from the 30s to the end of the 60s. This is the high point of liberalism. Look at the presidencies. Even President Eisenhower accepted much of the New Deal. And that's the narrative, and it all falls apart in the 70s. There's a backlash, and we are in the period that uh, leads from Reagan right through today. And I think those perspectives usually don't bring Congress into the history of the period. Uh, 
uh, because the, the history of Congress is very different. If you're looking at the history of Congress from the late 30s to the early 70s, again, the dominant force is this conservative coalition. They controlled the committees in Congress. Uh, Speaker Rayburn didn't have ways always around uh, their intransigence on, on many pieces of legislation, and they were a very conservative force in Washington. That was part of Johnson's project, was always trying to figure out a way to get around them. So a lot of historians uh, are looking at different ways in which conservatism was a much bigger force in American life than we knew before the 1970s, not just after. So that's point one. And Johnson always understood this. There's a, another great quote uh, where, and you'll have to pardon my language, but those of you who worked with President Johnson. But uh, after the teach-in, I think, in Michigan, the first one, uh, and I can't remember, one of his advisors was telling him, you know, you're starting to get some turbulence on Vietnam. There was this teach-in in Michigan, uh, and, and there's left-wing students, basically, who are starting to mobilize. And he didn't care, and he said, uh, I don't, he said, I don't care what those little shits on the college campuses do. The, uh, this quote isn't exactly right, but the great beast in this country is the reactionary right. Uh, and I think that was really important. Under Johnson understood this, and I think I try to bring it back into the period. So it wasn't as if he could just do whatever he wanted. That was not the politics of the period. And the presidential power uh, gets to what I was talking about a little, a little before. It's understanding... Uh, the ways in which that 89th Congress, that's the Congress post-1964 election, and not just the majorities that Democrats had, 295 Democrats in the House, I think 68 Democrats in the Senate, and the balance tilted to the liberal wing of the party, uh, and how important that was to the success of a lot uh, of, of what occurred. Um, and it wasn't simply the numbers, it was the organization of liberals on the Hill through the Democratic Study Group, uh, through uh, kind of mechanisms that Hubert Humphrey had put together in 64. Those were really important understanding why this was so smooth. So those are, the, the, those are why those two myths were so important to me, and I think important understanding that. So if you had to, if you had to categorize or list the major factors that you think were the most responsible for the prodigious and extraordinary, impressive list of of, uh, of of legislation passed through the Great Society. How would you how would you rank order them? Okay, a list. That's a good one. Uh, I, I'm a little leery of doing the list. I'll say they're all important, okay. but I'll give a rough list. Okay. I do I do think Johnson was a pretty magnificent politician. So I still, even though I'm trying to check. Uh, our, uh, the way we look at him, I still think he was very effective for the reasons I'm saying. Uh, his, his cognizance of limitations was as, as, as important as his ability to get things done. So his presence was obviously important. For me, the more I study this, and it wasn't meant to be the key to the book, it was the civil rights movement. And I, I mean, I've studied the civil rights movement, I knew about it, but when I really started to get into the timing of of how bills were moving or why Congress was opening up, it was incredible to see how that movement shook that status quo in Washington in pretty unbelievable ways. It became intolerable to do what had been done in the previous years. And that Civil Rights Bill of 64 opens the doors, I think, to a lot of what comes after. So, so I rank the movement very high, and I tell people today when they're, they're asking different questions about gridlock, uh, my one of my lessons from this is is how important that was uh, to 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 the legislative breakthroughs. So civil rights movement, you can put one or two, uh, and and the civil rights movement is not simply organizations like the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights that were focused just on issues of racial justice, but a whole constellation of liberal organizations, the AFL-CIO, religious organizations that were put part of a liberal coalition of the period from the bottom up. It was absolutely essential. And finally, it was the organized liberals in the House and Senate. Uh, for me, they were incredible. Uh, in 64, just watching Humphrey and Paul Douglas and uh, Joseph Clark, and all these liberals who had been frustrated for years, uh, starting with the Civil Rights Bill, uh, 
counting the votes, getting information out about what the Southerners were doing to try to stifle a lot of these initiatives. Uh, they, were, they were really a force to be reckoned with during those years, and in the House, the Democratic Study Group. So, so I rank not just the Congress broadly, but those liberals at that period, they gave Johnson what he needed on the Hill to make all this happen. They made sure at many stages this didn't fall apart. Uh, so I rank that, uh, those are the top three. I'm going to uh, call on the audience for uh, questions, and, and I'll ask one more while you're thinking. But you, you, you mentioned the protest movement and the civil rights movement in particular, and uh, obviously it, it, it really was transformational. I look also at the Vietnam protests and the organizational effort behind that and how much of an impact that had. How do you contrast, why, why is it that protest movements today, as, as important as they are on guns, on climate, on women, on, on a whole array of issues, don't seem to have that same traction? What, is there a way to analyze why it is that they were so successful and we don't get the same traction with protest movements today? That's, that's a, a million dollar question. One response would be they do, just they've done it on the right. Uh, and so conservatives from the 80s right through the Tea Party have been very effective at building not just grassroots movements, but grassroots operations that connect to media outlets or Washington operations that uh, are here, and they've been very effective. It, it's just been a different perspective of politics that's mastered that technique. So I, I think that's a fair uh, response and a fair assessment when I hear it. In terms of why various liberal groups, whether it's the gun control movement or Black Lives Matters, have not had that same impact, uh, you know, I, I think part of it, obviously, it's a it's a more fragmented era of mobilization. I do believe there are costs to social media activism. Uh, I think there was something about the commitment of people who met who were out on the streets on a regular basis, who were interacting with each other that is harder to replicate when a lot of it is social media based. And, um, and probably liberal grassroots groups today are more social media based still, I would bet, than some of the conservative groups, which are, tend to be a little older and probably using different techniques. So that's important. They haven't, the, the most remarkable thing for me about the 60s, again, was the umbrella nature of a lot of the movements. It was this different groups were connecting on these issues. So the Americans for Democratic Action, the AFL-CIO, uh, the religious groups I mentioned, and then there was something called the Leadership uh, Conference um, on Civil Rights, which brought all of them together. And I don't, I feel like, uh, at least for liberal activism today, that's not always the case. It's much more segmented and fragmented. And I believe that's hard uh, to, to sustain and you undercut some of your power. Liberals had the AFL-CIO, and I'll end on, I mean, that, the role of the AFL-CIO was immense uh, back in the 1960s. And when they joined forces with the civil rights movement or they were behind Medicare, they brought membership, uh, human power, money, political savvy that was really hard to match. And I'm not, I don't know today if there's anything like that to bring some of this together as a force. One of the characters in this book and other books is Andrew B. Miller, uh, who was a member from Wisconsin. Then he became a lobbyist for labor. And he's just one of these, you know, he's a presence. He's meeting uh, in the White House. He's meeting on the Hill on some of these issues. And, and movements ultimately need that kind of uh, connective force and then Washington-based force. And, and I think that's probably part of the answer in social media. Great. Questions? Yes, Martin. How, how, do, you think the, how, how do you think President Johnson would handle the uh, gridlock and chaos that dominates the whole political scene in Washington today? Yeah, so uh, that's a hard question in that I'm trained as a historian not to do counterfactuals. I was always drilled in me. Don't imagine what someone would do because you just don't know. But look, and I'm, uh, many of you in the room uh, know him, bet, knew him uh, better than, than I did. 
Uh, so this might be wrong, but, but my instinct is he would be a little different than President Obama, for example, in that I would imagine he'd be a pretty tough partisan right now uh, in terms of capitalizing uh, on every procedural advantage, every structural advantage that Democrats had, say, not now, but if he had been president uh, a few years early, he would not have hesitated to embrace the ugliness of congressional politics to get through a Democratic agenda. Uh, I, I believe that's how he would have approached it. Um, so reconciliation would be a welcome tool for him, uh, again, because of his cognizance of, of, of how limited time you have to do it. So, so I don't think he would be very bipartisan. I'm not even sure he would aspire to that in this day and age. I think he'd go the opposite direction. Could be wrong, uh, and I'm imagining him in 2018, not in 1964. So it's a different world. Could you speak to his relationship um, and uh, with the media back then? And I wouldn't say his manipulation of it, but he certainly had a relationship with it. He went into it, into broadcasting the family businesses, and uh, obviously it was a very different uh, media environment back then than we have now, but I think uh, it's an area where he doesn't get uh, enough attention for how he, um, uh, you know, worked with it and some of its uh, leaders, and uh, obviously it, it helped bring him down later in the 60s with Vietnam, but he was aware of how successful it was for, Mr. for President Kennedy and so I'm just curious as uh, whether you tackle that uh, relationship um, in the book. Were you going to add something? Or, no. Oh, I thought I heard you. Um, so it's not a theme in the book, uh, but there are some mo – so often historians who write about LBJ, they write about him as someone who's not fully comfortable in the TV media environment that's really taking form by the 1960s. And so that can range from comparing him to Kennedy, who was very – comfortable and charismatic and President Johnson could be more awkward or he couldn't exhibit the same kind of passion always when you watch old clips of him on TV that he would on the tapes that you hear. Uh, and there is that translation problem. And then there's the famous story that's been rebuffed about Walter Cronkite when Cronkite turns and that, that that's a turning point for John. So there's a lot of uh, critical uh, history. But there are some moments where he really did uh, kind of the media and the coverage of him becomes very important. So back to the speech you were talking about, the voting rights speech, is really, it's pivotal. Uh, when he gives that speech and the way it's covered in the print press is, is it, he, the words he used were perfect. Uh, and, and this is the speech. So, so initially President Johnson uh, was not planning to move on voting rights first thing in 1965, thought it would be too complicated, uh, thought doing it two bills at once would tie up the rest of his agenda, so he's going to wait. The civil rights movement basically forces his hand. Uh, that's an example where the marches at Selma made it impossible, in part because of the media coverage of it and what people were seeing. But then he makes this speech, one of the best presidential speeches, in my opinion, where he, also, he, he makes this powerful case for why voting rights is morally necessary and ends by saying we shall overcome, using the words of the movement that was still pretty radical. And there, uh, it's not a, a, a photo op event by any stretch, but it's a, it's a very uh, kind of good use of words and good use of coverage uh, that helps him very much. Um, so there are some moments like that. Um, but he's not, uh, I don't see him as someone who really masked, he's an era of inside Washington politics. Uh, he really is. And I don't mean that in a denigrating fashion. Uh, but, but the media was not always his best tool. He's more reactive to it. He's, he's watching it. He understands how it hurts him. But he's not a shaper of the media. He's not like Kennedy. He's not like Reagan. And you could argue he's not like our current president in terms of someone proactively shaping the narrative. There are a lot of great, one last thing, sorry. I love doing this. That's why I said uh, there, there are, you know, the, the other aspect is, so when the civil, when he comes into the presidency, the civil rights bill is going um, from the House Judiciary to the House Rules Committee. And they have to put pressure on the Rules Committee because Howard Smith, the chair, couldn't care less. He's the opposite of in favor of civil rights. 
Uh, and they, the, the Democrats of the study group basically build pressure for a discharge petition. And there's a great conversation where Johnson calls Catherine Graham, which is a, a different kind of relationship with the media. And he's basically encouraging her to publish stories about how the, the Democrats and the Republicans are secretly trying to stifle this bill. And he has great conversations where he's saying most Americans don't know how obstruction works. They're not like following the rules and they don't understand the power that this coalition had. And he's encouraging her to write stories. And stories do come out uh, soon after about this issue. So there is that more intimate relationship he had with the media where he did, he, he was a little more reactive that way. Hi, good evening. Um, we just, just a couple weeks ago, we just ended a very contentious Supreme Court confirmation and hearing. And I'm just curious if you could speak about um, uh, the, con the, the nomination process and confirmation process of Thurgood Marshall uh, by Linda Johnson. Yeah, so that is something, I'll be honest, I don't have as much in the book, uh, just because I had a whole thing on that and I cut it out. Um, you know, the, the, the bigger story, just in, so, so Marshall is, is a historic story. The story in terms of polarization is really um, Fortis. Uh, and it's often now dated as the beginning of the breakdown of, of, of how confirmations work, leading us right, right into today. And uh, you can speak much better than I ever can uh, about how this has evolved in the, in the last uh, few decades. But you do start to see in the mid-60s um, with his Supreme Court uh, confirmations, nothing like today. It, it is different than today. There still is a process in place. It can be contentious. It can start to get ugly and aggressive. But there does seem to be the sense in the Senate uh, of a, uh, a kind of a legitimate and an illegitimate way to do this. And right through the end of Johnson's term, uh, I think that was still in place, even though today we look back at the breakdown. Uh, and I, I think then the problem wasn't partisanship, it was bipartisanship. That's a thing to remember. It's, it's a Southern Democrat-Republican coalition, so it's a different dynamic on confirmations than you will see, you will see today. Uh, but I do think it's fair to say we were in a very different place in the 60s with confirmations uh, than where we are today. Yeah, it, I, again, it's hard for me to say would it have happened without him, and I wouldn't take him out of the equation. I mean, what, what's remarkable about Lyndon Johnson, uh, there's a, all, always there's a debate among historians how committed was he to civil rights. And this goes back to when he was president. I'm more on the side that whatever, wherever he had been the decade before, uh, by 64 he was squarely – behind this bill. And he was going to commit a lot of his capital, a lot of his power. It wasn't a politically smart thing to do. I, I mean, I do believe it contradicts some of what we say about Johnson. You might say, well, he anticipated how the Democratic coalition would change and that down the line, uh, this would benefit the party. But at the time, to just basically throw yourself behind the movement, run over the Southern Democrats who still had all this power, was a huge political risk, and the South was key to the Democratic coalition. So he was, it was essential he was there, not only for his savvy, not only to have someone who could take advantage of the moment, but a president who was actually committed to the cause. In a way, I don't believe Kennedy was. Uh, I, I don't think Kennedy was uh, antithetical to it, but Johnson, in, from my read, from my listening, uh, he, was, he was ready to roll on this. He was ready to move on the same with voting rights. I, I thought uh, Salma, the movie, got it wrong 
uh, that part of it for sure in terms of where Johnson's commitment was. So you can't, I, I don't know what would have happened. And the, the, the one thing to remember is the bill does start to move before he's president. So Kennedy had been resistant to sending the bill to the Hill. He did not want to do this. He thought it was a losing issue. He thought this would be it for Medicare for any possibility. But in June, he sends it. Why does he send it? It was because of the Birmingham protests. Uh, the, the movement had reached a mass where he understood that was not going to happen anymore. He had to send something. So, so things had changed before Johnson took over. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, there had been significant movement, but Johnson was still absolutely, uh, absolutely essential. And he had great relations with members of Congress. Again, one image of Johnson we all have and love is the treatment where he hulks over someone and corners them and uh, you know, basically coerces them into doing what he wants. But the other uh, part for me is those phone calls where he knew them and they knew him. He had these amazing relations with all the key players and I think that was important when the moment finally broke, not because of him, to capitalize on it and, and to keep this moving. So uh, he's not the only piece. I, I push back on that in this book, but he was nonetheless essential and committed. In terms of the legislation he was pushing, um, not the domestic legislation, really. Uh, they weren't. Uh, uh, you know, there were a few liberal business people in the coalition, but it wasn't as if the Chamber of Commerce, uh, which was the, or the National Association of Manufacturers, was, was very interested in the war on poverty. Uh, the one place they, they, they're very present is the tax cut. First thing Johnson does is he pushes a tax cut uh, in 64, and Kennedy had already been pushing this, and the idea is you'll boost the economy, you'll boost demand. That's where you see the business groups come in. They're fighting over different kinds of provisions in the tax code. Uh, but then the domestic policy making, uh, no, I, I, I didn't find them to be big players in the room. And then they come back in 67 and 68 when Johnson starts to push for a tax surcharge and the, the debate turns back to taxes. And that's where you see a lot of business groups mobilized to cut domestic spending. Uh, but they're not part of the progressive coalition in general, relative to where these other groups were. I just came from seeing the movie First Man. And I, the, uh, it chronicles Neil Washington oh. six months into the oh, right. administration stepping on to the moon. Yeah. And we all know John Kennedy inspiring everyone <laughs> The best, so the best things for that, you're right. Uh, it, it's in a lot of the books about, the biographies about him will have a little bit on him, on James Webb. It's usually through Webb that you see a lot of the coverage of, of what Johnson did. Obviously, Johnson is uh, in the Senate for Sputnik, and so uh, the work on him in the Senate covers him as a key player in the initial push for research funding uh, in 58, when the Congress passes legislation that starts to pour money into higher ed research, which will actually be important then to the space race program. It all comes out of Sputnik. That stuff on Johnson always has him as a key player. And he was very passionate about it. In part, it was political because it allowed Democrats to be a little more hawkish in the late uh, 50s, because you had Eisenhower pushing to cut the budget, balance the budget. Then you had Johnson, uh, Stuart Symington, Henry Jackson, who were saying we need to boost defense, and part of it was, was this kind. So that part of the story, 
The web story is often an avenue, but it's not, it, it, it's not a centerpiece uh, because, you know, it's just, uh, it's overshadowed uh, both by just the social programs that do get put into place under him combined with the overwhelming trauma of Vietnam. Uh, and, and so it has, you're right, it's faded. But he was, it's during his administration, all of this is, is getting into place. But look, historians love to capture ends of things. I think the, it, 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 this is why Congress, uh, I got into all of this back in the 1990s. First, I wanted to study political history. But then I decided I wanted to study Congress. That was what I loved. And almost there was no historian studying Congress. It, it's like, and it's still kind of a dead field. Um, and I've, it, it's, it's not compared to the presidency. It's just not, there's no comparison in terms of the volume. But for me, understanding Congress was really the way, the avenue in to understanding how politics worked, how our democracy worked, how compromises and divisions really move their way up into Washington. And I just love, I find the institution fascinating. Uh, and I really, I do remember watching you uh, and, and seeing the modern Congress. And, 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 and for me, uh, it was the best way to understand where we were in the 1990s and 2000s. And, and it's such, again, as all of you, uh, many of you have done this, uh, so you know. But the hard part, the reason many people don't study it as much and, and uh, our Senate historian here, who their office was always the best in terms of helping me on these parts of the projects. Um, it's a messy institution. It doesn't have the kind of clarity that the presidency has. It doesn't have a neat four to eight year timeline. It doesn't have a singular person that you could write about with a, a narrative drama. It, it has two chambers. There's different kinds of leaders within each chamber. And often part of what's happening in Congress, there's no real end. So the space program under Johnson, it will starts under Kennedy, finishes with Nixon, but a lot happened. But if I'm going to write a dramatic story, it's a, well, the budget went up, you know, the, the good appropriate. It's not the stuff of which great stories are made. So those are, I think that's part of why some of that kind of, um, those aspects sometimes fall out. I do believe that's part of what happens. But you're right in terms of a significant part of his uh, contribution. That's a that's one of my favorite stories of 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 this presidency. So so Johnson does not is not the first president to push for Medicare. Medicare is an idea that liberals start to push in the late 50s uh, in the House and Senate, and it's an alternative to national health insurance. So many liberals say in the late 50s we're not going to get national health insurance. We saw what happened to President Truman. So let's try to narrow the request. Let's make it. Uh, a, a more targeted program, B, targeted toward a uh, part of the population that people see favorably, uh, meaning the elderly, and C, let's put it in the Social Security program, which was already in place. It was pretty robust. It was a known commodity. So that was the strategic change. But the co this coalition I keep talking about said, no way, it's not going to happen. Uh, the Southern Democrats, including Wilbur Mills, who's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, says, uh, first, it's going to force an increase in Social Security taxes that bankrupts the program. And B, it's a form of socialized medicine, which was the tagline of the AMA. Kennedy tries to push for Medicare. This is really his signature program. This is what he wanted more than anything else, and he can't get anywhere. It's totally blocked. Uh, they, don't, they don't even allow it in ways and means uh, to move out to the floor. Uh, and, and Kennedy tries. He has a huge rally in Madison Square Garden. Um, uh, there's a big pro-Medicare rally. Organized labor's pushing for it, but nothing's really happening. Johnson becomes president. He quickly embraces the cause. Uh, and, and it's big. It, it's up there with civil rights. Now people forget that, I think, uh, but it was just as dramatic. Uh, 
But the, the coalition's still saying no. And even in 1964, even after Kennedy's assassination, even after all the goodwill that existed, which we often talk about after Kennedy's death, and even with Johnson Savvy, until that November election, it, there's no movement. In fact, Wilbur Mills kills a bill in a conference committee that they try to put in through an amendment, so Medicare is getting nowhere. Goldwater runs against Medicare, and he gets defeated in one of the worst landslide elections. So in 65, there's not a single Republican. There are a few, but most Republicans, they're in favor of some kind of health care. The election totally flips the dynamics on Capitol Hill, and many of the young new Democrats have run saying we're going to do that. So Wilbur Mill, uh, he flips his position, and he says in January of 65, I'm in favor. And I'll finish quickly that uh, then you have three versions of Medicare by March of 65 in the House. One is Medicare health insurance for the elderly through Social Security taxes. Two is a version that John Burns, the ranking Republican on Ways and Means, proposed, which is voluntary physician's insurance for your doctors paid for by a contribution from uh, the, the participant and a contribution from the federal government. And three, there's a version supported by the AMA, and Tom Curtis was pushing it, Congressman Curtis, which is basically a welfare program. Federal government will help pay for a state federal program for the medically indigent. And the famous story is in March, Mills wraps them all together in a three-layer cake, they call it, and sends this back and gets it through the House, it provides all of it, Medicare A, Medicare B, and Medicaid. Uh, and, and Johnson, uh, for me, that's the case. Johnson's very much in favor of it, and his support is essential, but it's that election. It's elections really matter in policymaking, and the election totally changed the dynamics on the Hill, and that's why people started to turn. Uh, it wasn't simply some maneuver that happened, and it's a big breakthrough. It's a big breakthrough. We're going to give Ambassador Jones the last question. Very good presentation tonight. Thank you. Had many, uh, many comments. Basically, Johnson had an instinct for the Congress, even though he had not been there in several years. And you mentioned the Fortis nomination. Uh, Johnson had every day he was instructed to have at least three or four members of Congress come down to the White House and visit with him, have a drink, etc. He was on the phone constantly. And then we had a very good congressional uh, liaison led by Larry O'Brien and Mike Manitos and Henry Wilson. But uh, all of us on the staff were divided up and we had to have a certain number of members of Congress that we kept in touch with on a weekly, if not a daily basis. And when it came to the Fortis nomination, we organized Alexander, Joe Califano, Barry McPherson, myself, et cetera. And there were about six of us, and we had each had members of the Senate to get this through the Senate. And we would come back and have a meeting almost every day with the President in the Oval Office and give him a report. He was always opposed to moving forward with Fortis. And then finally one day, he said, boys, we've lost it. Uh, and he, he instinctively knew when the tide had turned in the Senate Yeah, no. Uh, yes, and, and he also, the, the medic, back, I mean, with the Medicare story, what was remarkable to me is he was willing to give a lot of room. Uh, a, he was patient. So, in addition to knowing losses from my read, and, uh, and I was not there, uh, he, he was patient in that he was ready to let it come up again. Uh, he, he didn't give up instantly. Exactly. He split the AMA and he allowed Wilbur Mills some room to get credit on this and to devise the bill, a bill, send it back to him, but, but, but he allowed that too. So his feel uh, for the different parts, whether it was a loss, whether it was when to give Congress space to do things, uh, was remarkable. And, and I imagine it comes from being in the institution so long. I mean, we have, we have lost that to some degree having what we, many people don't want uh, presidents from Washington. 
They don't want presidents who've been in Congress uh, for a long time. Uh, and I think with Mills, I mean, <laughs> with Johnson, you really uh, gain an appreciation because of the story you told of these other stories of what value added that brings. And again, it's not just understanding the process, it's a relationship with the key players, which you can't replace. Um, and so I think that was really, that was quite important for those years. Oh, Professor Zelzer, we thank you uh, for the insights, the incredible tutorial tonight, for your research as a former member of Congress, for your focus on Congress, and uh, I hope you'll keep writing. I want to sign up for your class, I'm telling you. That'd be an honor. What a, what a, what, will you join me in thanking? Thank you. Thank you, everyone.